As Christians, we speak often about the grace of God. We talk about being saved by grace. We describe God as being imminently gracious. We sing of God's grace. We've done that this morning, where all of our songs were thematically oriented around grace. We name our churches after grace. In every town, in our country, and around the world, you will find churches named Grace something. Whether that's Grace, even in our town, Grace Baptist or Grace Hill, um, churches are named after Grace. Believers are people of Grace. But what exactly is Grace? Specifically, what is God's Grace? Grace is one of those Christian words like faith that we all throw around, that we all use, that we all say, but we aren't always on the same page by what we mean by those terms. In our day, for, for example, many pastors and many Christians speak about grace as if it's some sort of license to sin. Grace covers your sin, the logic goes, so you are free to live however you want, free from the law, free from God's demands. That's grace. But is this how the Bible describes grace? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be spending our time working through Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, where we're going to see the Apostle Paul describe for us what grace is. So you're opening your Bible to Titus 2. Look with me at verse 11. Well, even though we'll be spending all of our time on verse 11 this morning, I want to go ahead and read through 11 through 14 to kind of set the stage and, and show us what we're working towards, where we're going. So Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, believe it or not, this passage, which is is a paragraph in in our Bibles, in the original Greek is only one sentence. And if you have a a copy of the ESV in front of you, you'll notice that they retain the form of the Greek as well. In your copy of the ESV, you'll notice this is also just one sentence. It's a very complicated, big sentence that has a lot of running parts. And that's why we're going to be spending the next month working through one sentence of Holy Scripture because this is jammed packed with so much theology and truth. New Testament scholar I. Howard Marshall, he is not in the slide. Uh, Well, I'll just read the quote to you. I thought he was in there. Apparently he is not. Uh, I. Howard Marshall paraphrases this text this way. He says this. The passage thus forms the basis for the preceding instruction on the Christian living by reminding the readers the purpose of God's saving intervention in the world and the self-giving of Christ to deliver people from evil behavior and to make them into a community characterized by good works. God's grace has an educative, transforming effect on people, which enables them to turn away from godlessness, to live lives of positive goodness, and to look forward to the final revelation of God's glory in which they will share. Consequently, it is appropriate that they should accept the instructions given to them as part of the educative process in which they have been enrolled. Now that quote is just Marshall putting into his own words what this passage is all about. This passage, Titus 2, 11 through 14, is what we've been working towards when we started this book. It is the very center. It is the very heart of this letter. It's what Paul is arguing for 
do this because of this. And then when we get to chapter three, everything is going to flow out from this. This is the reason why our series, our study of Titus is called Gospel Life, because the gospel is central to Paul's letter to Titus. Everything works towards it and everything works out from it. And we're going to begin our study this morning of the gospel and of grace by seeing Paul's description of saving grace found in Titus 2.11. So look with me back at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll look at what the message is for us this morning, what the Lord has for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning eager to hear from you. And as we look at this passage, God, I I do ask that you would help us to see its meaning clear, that you would help us to, to see the wonder of your grace, to see the wonder of your salvation. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we have two points this morning, and I'll give them to you up at front. Our verse, Titus 2.11, has two major points to it, two major thoughts to it. The first part is the appearance of grace. The second part is the accomplishment of grace. So let's consider point number one, the appearance of grace. For the grace of God has appeared, the Apostle Paul writes. Our text begins with the word for, and this clues us in that what Paul is about to write is connected to what he's already written. As we've seen for the past couple of weeks, Paul has been laying out specific instructions for different groups within the family and within the church. He's given specific commands for how older men are to live and older women and younger women and younger men. He just finished his discussion with how slaves were to live. All of these commands, do this, don't do this, be like this, don't be like this. All of those are, are, are given for a reason. And that reason is stated for us here in verse 11. Here is the reason why older men are to live like this. Here is the reason why older women are to live like this. Here is the reason why younger women and younger men and slaves are to live this way. What is the reason? The reason why men and women and slaves are to live a certain way is because God's grace has appeared. And with the appearance of grace in this world, Paul says salvation has been brought to all people. Grace is one of those words that we use all of the time. We say that someone is gracious, meaning they're talented or or charitable or dignified or they don't let things get underneath their skin. Very gracious. Before we eat a meal, we usually say grace, meaning that we're expressing through a prayer our thanks to God for this gift of food. Or if you're my mom and she's praying, uh, saying grace, she'll pray for everything but the food and then forget about the food altogether. But usually when we talk about saying grace, what we mean by that is you are giving, you are giving thanks. You're expressing thankfulness to this gift of food that God has given you. When we sing about grace, we, we are meaning that we, we lift up our hearts and we express praise to God for his saving intervention in our lives. We were heading one way to death and destruction, and God intervened. We call that grace. We name our churches grace, meaning that we define our newfound identity in Jesus Christ as that being grace. So grace is a word that is used both in the culture at large and in the church. Christians are defined by grace. We sing about grace. And yet sometimes we really don't understand what grace is. So Paul here uses the word charis, uh, which is Greek for grace. It's you, charis sur- surfaces 150 times in the New Testament, and it literally means this. Grace, the state of kindness and favor towards someone, often with a focus on a benefit given to the object. By extension, gift, benefit, credit, words of kindness, thanks, 
blessing. So, so any one of those words can be rendered for the word charis, which is what the ESV translates here as grace. And specifically, the ESV will translate charis in several different ways throughout the New Testament. You have the most prominent one, which is the word grace, but charis is also translated as thankfulness, as favor, as benefit, and as gift. Any one of those words is an acceptable translation for charis. Grace, thankfulness, favor, benefit, gift. Grace is a rich word and and it has depths of meaning. Grace is how we are redeemed. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So grace is not only the way that we're redeemed, grace is the way that we grow as believers. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that... All sufficiency... Can you give me my water valve, please? Thank you. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound... Look at this woman. Thank you. Ooh. What a rock star. She's, the, um, she's the, the official administrative assistant at Higher Ground Church. Grace. That was a very gracious act, Val. Thank you. And you'll notice <clears throat> our, our corporate sponsor for Higher Ground is not here this morning, Topo Chico. And that's the reason why I'm coughing. <clears throat> it's not the Rona. Don't freak out. It just got really dry in my throat. Anyways, grace is the means of growth. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things, you may abound in every good work. Grace is what redeems us and grace is what gives us the way to grow. The Bible describes grace as a shorthand for the Christian life. Listen to Peter in 2 Peter three eighteen. But grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Paul, in the New Testament, will often open or or close his letters to his readers by wishing them grace. Romans 1, 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace to you from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Christian, grace is critical. Grace defines us, it describes us, and it should characterize us. To help us come to a definition of grace, we'll get, a help, we'll get help from two theologians that I love and have benefited greatly from. The first is an Anglican, and the second is A Methodist. So let's hear first from an Anglican, J.I. Packer, his description and definition of grace. Packer writes this The grace of God is love freely shown toward guilty sinners, contrary to their merit, and indeed in defiance of their demerit. It is God showing goodness to persons who deserve only severity and had no reason to expect anything but severity. Packer will then go on to define grace this way, and it's the more pithy, quotable definition. Packer writes this, what is grace? In the New Testament, grace means God's love in action toward people who merited the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sending his only son to the cross to descend into hell so that we guilty ones might be reconciled to God and received into heaven. So that's uh, our Anglican friend, Packer. Now let's hear from the Methodist theologian, Thomas Oden. Oden writes this, Grace is an overarching term for all of God's gifts to humanity, all the blessings of salvation, all events through which are manifested God's own self-giving. Grace is a divine attribute revealing the heart of the one God, the premise of all spiritual blessing. 
Grace is the favor shown by God to sinners. It is the divine goodwill offered to those who neither inherently deserve nor can ever hope to earn it. It is the divine disposition to work in our hearts, wills, actions, so as actively communicate God's self-giving love for humanity. I love Odin's definition of grace. He stresses the nature of grace as well as grace's action in salvation and sanctification. Odin summarizes what grace is, how grace saves us, and how grace changes us to be more like Jesus. Both of these definitions are of grace capture its, its very essence. Both of them summarize the concepts of grace that we have just surveyed in the New Testament. Grace is the manifesting action of God to redeem a people who do not deserve it. Grace is the empowerment of God to transform us into his likeness. The same grace, what we're going to what we're going to see as we work through Titus 2:11 through 14 over the coming weeks is the same grace that saves us sanctifies us. That's what this is all about, grace, saving grace training grace, anticipating grace, and sanctifying grace. Grace, Paul says, has appeared. This is the word epiphino, and it means to appear, to make an appearance, to show oneself. In the original setting of the New Testament, the word epiphino was used in a very specific way. It was used in reference to the appearance of a god or the appearance of the emperor. It was the appearance of something that was hidden that has now been made visible. So, so when Paul uses this word, epiphino, it's not coincidental. It's not an accident. He is taking the culture's use of this word and he's Christianizing it. He's giving it a Christian meaning. Because when this word ep- epiphino was used in New Testament times, it was used in, in reference to the appearance of the emperor to the appearance of a god, the appearance of some supernatural, powerful being that has now arrived on the scene. Think darkness giving way to morning light. Think we're losing a battle and the Roman emperor appears. Think Helm's Deep when all hope is lost and with the morning dawn, there's Gandalf with the Rohirrim charging down the side of the slope to annihilate the Urukai. I mean, when you watch the two towers, that is epic. It's over, right? Theoden is preparing to just go out there with a suicide charge. They look up to the east with the rising sun. There's Gandalf the White on a white horse coming down. Awesome. Awesome. That's this word, epiphino. Darkness to light. The appearance of that which wasn't seen. Epiphino appears four times in the New Testament. Two of those references of Epiphino are here in Titus. In Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And then in the next chapter, Titus chapter 3, we're going to see Epiphino again. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. So that's two of the references of Epiphino in the New Testament. One of the other references of Epiphino is the stars not showing in Acts. And the final reference of Epiphino comes from Luke 1, and it's significant for our purposes this morning. In Luke 1, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, while prophesying about Jesus' ministry, describes Jesus this way. Oh, he's prophesying about John's ministry, but he's talking about Jesus in verse 78. In 9, 78, 79, when he says this, Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sun shall visit us from on high, the sunrise, whereby the sunrise shall visit us on high to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zechariah prophesied, that the, the one that his son is going to pave the way for, John the Baptist, the one that, that John the Baptist is going to prepare the way for is the one that Zechariah describes as a sunrise from on high. A sunrise that's going to give light to those who sit in darkness. 
A sunrise that's going to give light to those who sit in the shadow of death. A sunrise that's going to give light to guide our feet into the way of peace. And of course, as you remember, as we just worked through John's gospel, we called that series Light and Life. Jesus is the light of this world. In John 1, 4 through 5, we read about Jesus, and this is how we hear about him in John's gospel. In him, in Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And of course, in John 8, Jesus himself would describe himself as light. In John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light who has come into this world of darkness. He has epiphano. He has appeared. Darkness has given way to this shining light, and that light is Jesus Christ. When we say here that grace has appeared, when, when, when when Paul tells Titus, grace has appeared. He's talking specifically about grace appearing in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the very embodiment of God's character and nature because he is truly God. Jesus is God made man. Jesus is the walking, talking expression of grace. The Apostle John put it this way in John 1, 14 through 17. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, for from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Paul would tell Timothy this in 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 10. He saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. God's triumphant grace has appeared. And that appearance of triumphant grace happened when Jesus came into the world. Because Jesus lived a perfect life, dying on the cross and bursting forth from the grave on Easter morning, Jesus was the very triumphant, victorious arrival of God's grace. You want to know what grace is like? You look to Christ. Jesus is the embodiment of grace. You want to know how grace responds to life? You look to Jesus. You want to see grace in action? You look to Jesus. Jesus is the expression of grace itself. He is grace personified. Grace has appeared. Jesus has come. So God's grace, the source and sustaining power of the Christian life enfleshed in Jesus has appeared. And what does the appearance of grace accomplish? What did Jesus accomplish when he appeared? Well, let's now look at point number two here at the latter part of verse 11, the accomplishment of grace. The grace of God has appeared. Look what Paul writes. Bringing salvation for all people. God's grace has appeared. His triumphant, victorious revelation of Jesus Christ has come. And what is the result of the appearance of grace? Salvation, Paul writes, has been brought to all people. This is the word soterios, meaning bringing salvation, meaning delivering someone, saving someone. 
And of course here, the salvation being described is salvation from God's wrath, salvation from sin. Paul here is talking about the gospel's work of redemption. And the word that the ESV renders here as people is not the word people. It is the word anthropos, which is the plural form of anthropos. This is mankind. This is mankind. Paul is not saying that God's grace has appeared to all people, but brought salvation to all people. He's saying God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all of mankind. And if you have a translation other than the ESV, it may render it more accurately as mankind. God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all men. Now that seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? But we have to be very careful here because there are many people who would take what is Paul, what Paul is saying here and twist it into doctrinal error. So before we can explain what this phrase does mean, it's important to clarify what it does not mean. When the apostle Paul here writes that God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all mankind, he does not mean that all mankind will be saved. When Paul says that salvation has, that God's grace has brought salvation for all people, he understands he's not saying that all people will be saved. We know for a fact that not all people will be saved. Jesus himself taught not all will be saved. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. What Jesus is saying is that the broad way is the way that leads to destruction and many go down that path. The narrow way which leads to life, there are few that go down that path. What Jesus is saying is that the many are on the path to destruction. The few are on the path to life. He will clarify this even further in verse 21 of Matthew 7, where he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So Jesus says that the way to heaven is the narrow path and few will be on it. He says there are those even within the church who on judgment day are going to say, I did this for you and I did this for you. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians states the reality that not all people will be saved in some very graphic language. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-10, Paul writes this, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. So understand here in Titus 2.11 that when Paul says that God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all of mankind, he is not saying all of mankind will be saved. We We know that's not the case. We know that from the very words of Jesus, and we know that from Paul in his letter to 2 Thessalonians. Not everyone will go to heaven. The theological position for this is called universalism. Uh, universalism kind of wanes, comes and goes in popularity. In 2011 with Rob Bell and his book, Love Wins, it was, it was a, the big comeback of universalism. But it's this idea that everyone will go to heaven. 
Uh, you have this idea expressed in bumper stickers down the road when you see coexist. And you have like the, you know, Muslims and Buddhists and Christian, whatever. They're all different spokes on the same wheel. They're all different perspectives going up to the same mountain. No, no, no. The Bible's very clear. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Christianity alone is the lone path to salvation. And Jesus and Paul are both saying that not all will be saved. So, if Paul is not saying that every person's going to be saved, even though salvation has been brought to them, what is he saying? Now, there are two ways to understand this. Two ways to understand the all people to which Paul's referring. The first perspective, the first interpretation, is that Paul does not literally mean every person. When, when Paul says in Titus 2.11, the salvation, grace has appeared bringing salvation to all people, he doesn't mean every person, but all kinds of people. See, you see that? Remember, in context, in chapter 2, he's just been talking about different kinds of people. Old men, old women, young women, young men, slaves. The reason why all of those different kinds of people need to live a certain way is because God's grace has appeared to all different kinds of people, old, young, slave, or free. So that's perspective number one. Paul's not saying that God's grace has appeared to all people. What he's saying is that God's grace has brought salvation to all kinds of people. The second view is that Paul is not just referring to all kinds of people, but to all people. God's saving grace is available to every person that has lived throughout all time. And the reason why this interpretation has weight is because Paul will go from here in just a few verses in, in chapter 3 and say this. Remind them, this is chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect court, courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So God's saving grace in interpretation number two, perspective number two, God's saving grace that brings salvation has appeared to all of mankind. Therefore, we are not to speak evil of anyone. We're not to quarrel with anyone. We're to be gentle towards all and show perfect courtesy, courtesy to all people. Why? Because we were once like them. We were once lost, but God saved us. So those are the two interpretations, right? I don't care which interpretation you take, whether you view it as all kinds of people or every person that has ever lived. Both of those are orthodox and sound. What you cannot conclude from this passage is that all people will be savable or all people will be saved. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches the exact opposite. Many people, if not most people, will not be saved. Few will be saved. So you cannot arrive there. You cannot, you cannot be a universalist is what I'm saying. The Bible doesn't pro prohibit you to be a universalist. Now, of these two interpretations, you say, well, which one are you, Josh? Are you, do you believe Paul's saying that, that God's salvation has brought salvation to all kinds of people? Or are you saying that God's grace has brought salvation to every person? Which one do you, do you, do you believe? I believe that the one, the perspective that has more exegetical and New Testament weight is option number two. I take the second view. Believe that what Paul is saying here is that grace has made all people savable. I think that makes the most sense of where he goes in chapter three, where he says you need to be courteous towards everybody. You need to be nice to everybody because Everybody can be saved. I think that's the logic. I think that's the flow of his thinking. Not only that, but the availability of salvation to all people makes better sense of the weight of many texts in the New Testament. Several times in the pastoral epistles, Paul is going to state that salvation is available to all people. Titus 3.12. He's saying, do this because 
uh, to be gentle, show perfect courtesy towards all people. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4, he says, I then urge supplications, prayers, and accessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings who are in high possessions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. 1 Timothy 4.10, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. We read in the New Testament that the Bible describes salvation as being sufficient for all people. Acts 17.30, The times of God, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people to repent. Luke 2.10, the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. We read in the New Testament that God desires the salvation of all people. 2 Timothy 3 through 4. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible not only talks about God's desire for the salvation of all, but the Bible defines Christ's atonement as being a death for all. John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, for the love of God controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sight died and was raised. 2 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 2 Peter 2, 1, but false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but the sins for the whole world. Now, the reason why I've, I've read through all of those texts, not just trying to belabor a point or to beat a horse dead. The reason why I read through all of those, those points is because in, within Reformed theology, there is a divergence here. There are those in Reformed theology who who we differ on the extent of the atonement. We differ on the, salva- the availability of salvation for all people. So I'll give you an example. In the 1800s, two men that I quote all the time, both of them reformed. Charles Spurgeon believed in what is called limited or definite atonement, that Christ only died for the salvation of the elect and he did not intend salvation to be universal or for all people. Spurgeon believed that. If you were to hop on a carriage and go down the street in England, well, in a different city, you have J.C. Ryle, who is also reformed. J.C. Ryle did not believe in particular redemption. He did not believe in limited atonement. He called it an extreme doctrine. He said, the only reason why I even get up to preach is because I believe that anyone in the church, saved or not, is savable. God's grace is for them all. So within Reformed theology, and no one's going to question whether or not Spurgeon's Reformed or Ryle's Reformed, within Reformed theology historically, you have Reformed theologians falling on both sides of the aisle. Christ died for all. Christ only died for the elect. Both perspectives have been there historically. And as a church, we're going to have disagreements on secondary matters. We're going to have disagreements among the pastoral team. And that is okay. When I look at these texts, me, Josh Valdez, me personally, and J.C. Ryle, 
I cannot bring myself to say in every one of those passages that I just spit off that all means all kinds of people or that everyone means only the elect. I I can't do it. Some of those passages, I can do it. Some of those passages would make good sense, but not all of them. When, when, When we read that Jesus buys when, when, there, when we read in Second Peter that you have false teachers who are bought by Jesus and they deny him bringing destruction on themselves, I have no idea what that kind of buying would be other than atonement. It, it, nothing else makes any sort of sense. I have not read anything from proponents of definite atonement who make a compelling case for Second Peter 2.1. In fact, I see just the opposite where they say, hmm, Interesting. So, secondary matters are theological matters that shouldn't divide us Christians. Things like this, the continuation of spiritual gifts. Things like the nature of the millennium. Things like the timing of the rapture. Or even if there is a rapture, I don't know if you know this, there are many Christians who don't even believe there will be a rapture. The extent of the atonement, did Jesus die for the whole world or did he only die for the elect? These are secondary issues that should not divide us. Christians have real differences over them. Spurgeon and Ryle, if they sat down at a table, would have disagreed. If you were to go back into the Reformation on the nature of the Lord's Supper, Luther and Zwingli would not have agreed. If you would have sat down at a table in the Reformation and you have Luther and Calvin and Zwingli discussing um, worship music, they would not have agreed. Calvin's perspective was only the Psalms and only a cappella, no music whatsoever. Luther was on the other side and Luther said, let's use the organ and let's use, uh, I don't know what medieval instruments were. Let's use it all. And, and not only are we not only going to sing the Psalms, I'm going to actually write some hymns. And we sing some of Luther's hymns today, like a mighty fortress is our God. And one of, I think it's, is it Silent Night or Away in a Manger? One of those two written by Martin Luther, Okay. Men who are theologically in the same camp can have disagreements about secondary matters, and it's okay. It's okay. Our pastoral team here is not agreed on all things. Ethan and I are not agreed on the extent of the atonement. Ethan and I are not agreed about the the millennium and about eschatology, and that is okay. Okay. I don't, I don't give Ethan the cold shoulder because he's wrong in these areas, understand? Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't treat me any different. And that is a testament to Christian unity. So, so what I'm arguing here, and if you want the other perspective, go talk to Ethan, it's okay. What I'm arguing for is that there is a universal scope in salvation. Salvation's available to all people. God desires the salvation of all people and Jesus' death on the cross was for all. And yet, and yet, we know that not all people will be saved. More than that, we heard from Jesus himself that most people, most people will not be saved. So how do we reconcile this? Odin is really helpful here. He says this, God's offer of saving grace is always sufficient. Any deficiency always lies within the fallen and its distorted receptivity, not an intrinsic inadequacy of the gift. Sufficiency is intrinsic to the nature of grace. Any institution of deficiency must be traced to the inadequate acceptance of grace. Now understand what Odin is doing is he's different than than Owen. So you remember the Puritan John Owen would say that the, that the atonement can only be for the elect because otherwise Christ's blood is wasted. That's, that's Owen's argument in the death of death. And Odin, a couple hundred years later, is saying, no, 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 that understanding is wrong because it's not the question of sufficiency, but receptivity, right? It's not a, a question of, of is Christ's blood wasted or not? No, the atonement's been made. It's a question of who's going to be able to benefit from that. And one of the classic expressions of the availability of the atonement 
and the salvation of only a few. Okay, so how, 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 do we, how do we express that the salvation is available to all, but not all will be saved? Here, here's, here's the um, classic expression of this. The atonement is sufficient for all, but efficient only for the elect. That's what we're talking about this morning. Christ died for all, but only those he has chosen will be saved. You understand? The elect. The atonement is sufficient for everyone, but only the elect will have efficacious faith. It will only be efficient for them. The atonement is sufficient for all, but efficient only for the elect. <laughs> While all can be saved... And God commands everyone to repent. And he makes the means of salvation of, to repent available to all. Only the elect will come to faith in Christ. Now, we're talking about grace. We're talking about the appearance of grace. So why does Paul even include this affirmation, this line at the end of verse 11 that that Christ has brought salvation to all people. Why, 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 is it, why does this matter? And it, whether it's every person or all kinds of people, why does he do this? Paul does this because he has already described what the godly life accomplishes. Titus 2.5. The godly life accomplishes that the word of God is not reviled. Titus 2.8. The godly life accomplishes that an opponent may not be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. The godly life accomplishes in Titus 2.10 that in everything we may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So, so here's Paul's thinking. Remember, we're, we're, in a, we're in a context here. The reason why we're to live godly lives is because salvation is available to all. Either all people like I think or all kinds of people which other people think. Older men, older women, young men, young women, slaves, they're all to live godly lives because their godly lives commend or make attractive the gospel to all people. When an older man lives a godly life, he is making the gospel attractive to older men. When an older woman lives a godly life, she is making the gospel attractive to younger women or older women. When a younger woman lives a godly life, she is making the gospel attractive to a younger woman. When a younger man lives a godly life, he makes the gospel attractive to a younger man. And I'll give you uh, just a, a real easy example of this. JC's about to pop. She is pregnant. I also look like I'm about to pop, but for a different reason, okay? Gracie, or Gracie, JC can manifest grace to other pregnant women in a way that I never could. You know why? Because she's pregnant, I'm not. She is going through all of the things that accompany pregnant. My wife's a nurse. I'm just now learning about some of these things at this time, and it's blowing my mind. Wow. That's all going on, all right? She can, JC can manifest grace to other pregnant women in a way that I never could, even though we're both relatively young. See what I'm saying? So, so Paul is saying that within your stage of life, old, young, male, female, unemployed, employed, slave, it doesn't matter. You are uniquely prepared, uniquely equipped providentially placed in your life situation to manifest God's grace to people just like you. A widow is going to be able to manifest God's grace to another widow in a unique way. A, a, a single person is going to be able to manifest God's grace to other singles in a un, unique way, expressing that, that distance and that longing and that loneliness that they feel. Married couples, same way. It doesn't matter. Paul is saying... God's grace has appeared to all people and as Christians, we are the, the, the recipients of his grace and we can therefore manifest his grace to all people. Tim Chester writes this, Paul is not trying to persuade Christians to see their life as attractive in the sense of being easy. Instead, he expects that unbelievers will be attracted to this new life in Christ. Paul is saying that unbelievers will find life in Christ compelling 
even though that life is often countercultural and frequently costly. People will look at our lives and say, I want to live like that, or I want to grow old like that. And if they are attracted to our lives, then they may want to show an interest in our message. So Paul's logic in Titus 2.11 then makes perfect sense. You and I are to live godly lives that showcase the gospel. Our living godly lives stirs the appetites of unbelievers. The gospel life is the change life, adorning and commending the gospel's power. This right living is the visible expression of right belief. So here's the big idea this morning. God's grace, which is Jesus Christ and his gospel work, has appeared making salvation available to all so that Christians may attract all people through new life in Christ. And that leads us, practically speaking, okay, I, I, can, I can follow along with that. I can follow along with, with my being saved my living a holy life now is compelling for the unsaved. I, I'm, t- I'm a recipient of grace. I'm going to live a grace-filled life. I'm going to live a godly life that makes the gospel attractive. I get that. I can understand that. How do I do it? Give me some bullet points. Give me some very specific ways how I, as a single person or a young, young pregnant woman or an older man, how can I make the gospel compelling for those people just like me? How's that done? Well, in verse 12, Paul is going to tell us exactly how that's done. And we'll consider that next time. Let's pray. Father, we have seen this morning your grace. We have seen how your grace has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen how your grace has accomplished the salvation of all people. Not that all will be saved, but that all are savable. So Father, I I, I ask that you would help us here as your church to be a, a people who are living godly lives in the context that you've placed us, knowing that in your providence, you have put us where we're at, at the job we're at, in the family that we're at, in this city at this time, to reach those that you have placed around us. And one of the most powerful ways that we can reach them is simply to live a holy life that will stir within them a desire to know why. So Father, I do ask that you would help us to live holy lives so that way we can have opportunity to share the gospel with our unsaved friends, our unsaved family, and our unsaved co-workers. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.